Do you love? From your cold, clear rivers to your favorite outdoor getaways, the Nature Conservancy works to keep Montana a place where both nature and people can thrive. And by the BZN International Film Festival, a four-day event showcasing films that educate and inspire audiences to get involved and take action to protect our planet. For more information, visit bozemanfilmcelebration.com. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Gallatin Gardeners Club, and the Rocky Mountain Certified Crop Advisor Program. Good evening and welcome to Montana Ag Live, brought to you from the PBS studios at Montana State University. So we're in a bit of a transition period here and feeling our, our first real fall. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see some of the topics that uh, we'll discuss tonight. And um, tonight I have Jane Mangle, a weed science specialist here um, at MSU. And so she'll be here to answer any weed questions. And um, it's actually very fortuitous now that the weather is getting cold because we're going to be talking about sheep and wool tonight and the meat to, you know, and the calories to warm us up and also the wool to keep us warm. So we have Leah Johnson, who's the executive secretary of the Montana Wool Growers Association. And with her to kind of um, accompany her and, and enhance everything sheep and wool is Brent Rader, who is an extension specialist in the egg um, in the animal and range science department. And so he's also um, gonna have great information about you know, producing sheep and the sheep industry in Montana. And Mac Burgess, uh, who is in our plant sciences department, he is the small ag um, person and small farm specialist at MSU. And so he's here tonight to answer horticultural questions. Um, I'm Nina Zydak. I am the director of the Montana Seed Potato um, Association. So if you have any questions about potatoes or also vegetables and horticulture, I might be able to chip in on those too. So, um, so at this point, I'd like to go to Leah. And Leah, um, if you could talk with us just a little bit about um, you know, your, your position with the wool growers and um, the Wool Growers Association in Montana and, and what they're all about. Sure. Um, like I it's been introduced already. Um, I'm Leah Johnson. I'm the executive secretary for the Montana Wool Growers Association. I was just hired in March, so I'm relatively new. I got to start right about the time COVID hit, so that has made um, life a little interesting. But the Montana Wool Growers has been around since 1883, and Wool Growers advocates for whatever sheep and wool producers in our state need. So we offer advocacy, and then we also have leadership opportunities um, helping send producers to things with the American sheep industry. Uh, we have legislative trips in Helena and also to DC. And then just overall industry awareness, um, educational opportunities and helping put on programs in Montana and um, teach people about sheep and wool and promote the products that our producers grow. Great, thank you, Abby. Um, Brent, I uh, have a question that you know is on everybody's mind these days in all aspects of agriculture and in our economy. Um, what has the effect of COVID been on the lamb and wool industry in Montana and U United States and around the world? Yeah, it's had, it's had a very big impact, uh, actually, just like it's impacted most commodities. Uh, we, we do operate in, a, in an international marketplace now, and so it, it really hit home in Montana. Uh, we're just coming off of basically all time highs in the wool industry. Um, probably the, the late winter of 2019, we started to see some declines. Uh, in China, there was uh, some dispute uh, trade differences with China and that started to play a role in it. And then when COVID uh, hit in China in, in the late fall last year, they shut their factories down and a big percentage of the wool that's processed in the world is currently processed in China. So the factory shut down, 
then the factories reopened about the time that uh, we started shutting down because of uh, COVID restrictions in, in Europe and America. And with that, everybody just like we're doing tonight is, is on a Zoom meeting. And so nobody has to buy a really high end, really nice looking suit or business apparel. <laughs> and, uh, and so the demand for those products uh, dried up a little bit. And so we just don't have the orders. So the, the wool market right now, uh, even though the supply out there was getting smaller, it's starting to back up a little bit. Uh, the, the wool market domestically, about the only people buying wool, uh, the military is still producing uh, some uniforms and things like that. But essentially our domestic wool market has, has stopped. On the lamb side, it, it had a big impact too. Half of the lamb that we consume in the United States is consumed at white tablecloth, either restaurants or cruise lines. Obviously those businesses are really suffering right now. So we lost almost half of our demand for lamb in the United States almost overnight when, when COVID restrictions came in. We're starting to see, I think, some optimism in the business right now. The lamb market has is, is come back quite substantially in the last month because I think people think eventually we're, we're gonna get out of this and they need to put some lambs back on feed. Okay, great, thank, thank you very much, Brent. Um, I have a question that I'm gonna kind of put out there. Maybe it'll be a Jane question. Um, somebody else might know. Um, is poison, and this came in from Belt, is poison hemlock still poisonous to animals after it's died in the fall? Yes, I'm pretty sure it retains its uh, toxicity even when it's dried. So that can be an issue, uh, particularly if it gets baled into mm -hmm. some hay, it does retain that toxicity. Okay, thank you. So Mac, another question from Belt. Um, this actually came in last week. Um, can you use treated lumber for raised beds for growing flowers, vegetables, that type of thing? You don't need to. Uh, I'll start there. Um, we've got raised beds here in the Bozeman area made from just ordinary uh, Douglas fir timber that have lasted over 20 years. So, so uh, as far as having a rot resistant uh, product, we just don't have enough moisture here to really necessitate that. Um, there are many different types of treated lumber. I, I would suggest not to use them for a, a garden raised bed, but I, I wouldn't panic and go out and, and remove it if you've got one already. Uh, to do be consistent with certified organic production standards so that's a, a no-no there if you if you seek certified organic uh, status and then as far as uh, whether you can or whether it would be harmful that's going to really depend on the type of wood treatment that's that's being used and that, that's probably too complicated to go into here on live tv but there are many different concentrations and products that have been used for treated wood over the years some of them worse than others or some more safe than others but i think as a general rule i would say you don't you don't need to and i wouldn't seek it out sure and i remember just kind of as a general guideline i mean a lot of people use old railroad ties we actually have some in our yard and that's great for perennials and ornamentals and that type of thing but um, you definitely shouldn't use um, old railroad ties if you are going to be growing vegetables um, i would right exactly so so um, back to Leah, um, could you just tell us a little bit more about what breeds of sheep um, are grown in the state and how, how many sheep do we have in Montana? Sure, so the breeds change, you know, throughout history, they've changed in Montana and certainly around the world too, based on what they're needed for. So the various breeds of sheep can be used for different wool quality or wool types and also for different meat characteristics. So in Montana, we have a lot of range type operations, especially in Eastern Montana and in Central Montana. Um, we've got a lot of like Targis, Columbias, or a couple of white face breeds. And then as far as uh, black face breeds, where they have black, you know, dark faces and dark legs, we have Suffolk, um, Hampshire. And there's lots of other breeds, especially as you get into Western Montana, into more um, farm flock type uh, production, you see more of like Icelandics, Border Lesters, um, specialty breeds with different places for hand spinners and things like that. And Brent can probably comment on this too more. Yes, and I just want to follow it up with another question that just came in from Laurel. Uh, the person is asking, is the Make It With Wool contest going on this year? 
Yes, that is part of our annual convention in our Montana Wool Growers Convention. It is supposed to be held in Billings. As most of you know, um, some new restrictions are going to be put in um, Yellowstone County due to their COVID numbers. So we're going to have to look at exactly how that's going to pan out for us if we're going to have to change venue or locations. And that will be announced as time goes on and we get together with the board and figure that out. But yes, the Make It With Wool contest is um, spotlighted during our convention and the uh, regional Make It With Wool contest will happen in October. And you can find all of that information on our website at mtsheep.org. Amanda Powell, who runs the Make It With Wool program, um, has a great write-up on there with all the details. So if you're wanting to participate or you're wanting to watch or, or help in some way, all of that information is there. Great, thank you, Leah. And uh, at this point, I'll follow up uh, with, with Brent. Um, what are the trends in the wool industry these days? So there's been a quite a resurgence. Um, like I said, we're coming off of our highs uh, recently in the 2017, 2018 timeframe. Some of that's because the, I mean, a lot of people will remember the, maybe a wool sweater that your grandmother had, <clears throat> really itchy wool sweater. Wool, the, the wool processing and wool genetics have evolved substantially. And I think Australia kind of led that, um, <clears throat> led that shift with their Merino breed. Uh, we have some of that genetics now in the United States, but also because of a lot of work done at the, the wool lab at Montana State University and through some genetics programs and good breeding by the, by the great producers that we have here in this state, we, we have wool on a, that's on a comparable level with the merino wool that comes out of Australia. So that, that wool you can wear next to skin now. We have several companies that are based here in Montana that, that produce a really high-end athletic wear that's next to skin, it can absorb 40% of its weight in water and still uh, retain heat. Uh, it's recyclable, renewable. One of the things that we're learning about <clears throat> as we move forward, Prince Charles in, in England has a what he calls the campaign for wool. And he's basically trying to highlight some of the positive attributes of wool production. And uh, one of the things that a lot of the research over there came out with is that a lot of our man-made polyester type fabrics are substantially contributing to the microplastic contamination on our waterways, which is starting to be, I mean, a lot of people are starting to realize it's at the major contaminant of our fresh water moving forward. So we see a lot of emphasis now, we're getting a lot of interest at the wool lab and in, in, in trying to figure out how to use a hemp wool blend. Uh, there's a lot of cotton wool blends. And so with that, <clears throat> we've also seen a real severe decline in sheep numbers in Australia uh, and New Zealand also because of drought conditions and other economic factors. So while we were seeing an increase in consumer demand for wool because of its uh, environmental attributes and the quality of it, we were also seeing a decrease in the production of that really high quality wool. And so that's why we had that big <clears throat> price spike uh, in 2017 and 2018. And it, the wool will come back. Um, I just encourage all the producers that are out there listening. We had a fantastic sale in Mile City in September, really highlighted the producers are still looking for those high quality, extremely uh, good wool bucks that are out there uh, and, and so I, wool's gonna come back in a year or two. It's, we just need to get through uh, our current uh, issues right now worldwide, so. Leah or Brent, I have a follow-up question. If you were, do you raise a different breed of sheep, whether you're raising it for, for meat or wool? Yeah, so, <clears throat> So there's several different, we break the breeds of sheep into, into wool breeds like Merino um, would be primarily a wool breed. They, they do produce lambs out of them, but their lamb production is, is, so wool and lamb production tend to be antagonistic, meaning that they work against each other. Uh, and then we have the medium wool breeds that do a fantastic job of raising high quality lamb here in Montana, the, the Hamps, the Suffolk, uh, those type breeds, the Shropshires. A lot of what we produce in Montana are what we call dual purpose breeds. And so those would be breeds like Targhee, Columbia, Rambouillet. Uh, those are breeds that produce a, a fairly fine type of wool that we can still use for uh, mid layer and in some cases next to skin uh, 
base layer type products, but they also are, are very good at producing lamb. And so that's kind of what we tend to call a dual purpose breed. You get, you get two paychecks a year, you get a good wool paycheck in the spring and you get a good lamb paycheck in the fall. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Brent. So I have a question on potatoes that came in from Hamilton. Um, when they harvest their red potom Potomac potatoes, they are hollow in the middle and a layer of dark middle around the hollow area. What's wrong? Well, you've asked it exactly right. It's hollow heart. That's the name of the disorder. And it's a physiologic disorder. And it usually occurs um, when there's probably just a little bit um, of a disruption during the growing season. The plant's growing really, really, really fast. And then um, you might get a little bit of fluctuation in moisture or something like that that, that affects um, how fast the plant is growing. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, some varieties are more susceptible to getting hollow heart. Um, basically, just cut down the middle of your potato and and peel out that that part of the potato. But it actually it shouldn't affect how your potatoes um, store, and it won't affect the quality except for you know baking if you wanted to use the whole potato. It sounds like you could stuff some cheese or something in <laughs> exactly, there. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. A great place for cheese. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Mac. Uh, this is a question that came in over Facebook. Uh, my attempts at growing winter squash have never produced much flavor. Why is that? Well, we could have a whole special segment on this topic, Nina, about winter squash. The short answer is probably you need to wait a little while before you eat them. So uh, winter squash, uh, we'll have to pick them before we have a heavy frost. We picked ours here in Bozeman before our September 7th frost. And many of them are described as, as being um, best eaten after at least a, a month of storage and maybe as much as three to five months of storage indoors. They're gonna get better with storage time. So maybe you were just in a too big of a hurry to eat them. Uh, the other thing is variety selection. And there's a, a whole bunch of, of really cool squashes of, of th things you don't see in the stores. Um, there are three different species of squash that we eat as winter squash. And within each of those species, there's different uh, market classes that have some really, really superb edible squash. So I've got a whole pile of them next to me here and, and we can go through a couple of them if you want. But one of my favorites are the delicata squash. So these are a cucurbita a pepo. They're, they're fairly small in size and they're reliably good producers, uh, even here in Bozeman where we have a fairly cool climate. Um, but I wanna store this, I haven't eaten any yet. Um, these will be at their prime from Thanksgiving um, well into spring, uh, up into March, just fine. These green stripes will start to turn yellow and orange, and that's how you know they're at their at their very best. Another one of my favorite ones is red curry. It's spelled K-U-R-I. This is an open pollinated uh, cucurbita maxima uh, squash, or known as a Hubbard squash market type, and these are reliably really good. But I guess the other thing I would think about if you're choosing a variety from the seed catalog is choose ones with a, a little bit shorter um, days to maturity rating, we have a hard time ripening butternuts well here and just, there's just not very many that are, that are less than 105 days to maturity. And I've got much more of them to show you if we have time. So, so I'll actually chime on in on that a little bit, Mac, because growing winter squash like in the Gallatin at a higher elevation can be a little bit challenging. And what I found was for many years, I harvested a lot of squash that really didn't have the best flavor and it didn't have that real dry kind of fluffy texture um, when you mashed it that you know is enhanced by butter and cream <laughs> um, but since we've started using floating row covers on our um, squash in the spring I actually start out with transplants and then use floating row covers until about the first of July uh, depending on the season but for a significant amount of time that really protects the squash and gets them established much better. And I think just overall, um, they, they're, you know, by the time we actually hit the heat of the summer, they're really, really raring and ready to go. And um, I've just had much better maturity and better quality since I started doing that. And then those floating row covers go back on in the fall. <laughs> so, so that you can you're get another couple you're weeks. Absolutely right. those, uh... All those regular season extension tricks do help a bit and, and will help you get into some of those squashes that, that wouldn't be as, as readily uh, grown here. So, you know, doing transplants and getting them in, I want to say the end of May, early June. And mm -hmm. then here again, as usual, we had a, a, a near a close miss with a frost on June 12th, as we often do here in the Gallatin Valley. And so you needed to have those covered up uh, that night. And, and that's been the case the last couple of years. It would have helped you to 
have your squash covered up on, on June 12th, but you do need to get them in early, transplants help, everything you can do to, to keep that heat retained, to have warm soil will help have a higher yield. And then you've got to remember to take those row covers off though, because they are pollinated by bees and the, the male and female flowers are separate. And sometimes squash plants will, if they're under stress, produce more male flowers and produce male flowers exclusively at first. So uh, when you start seeing flowers, make sure they've got adequate water and are experiencing uh, ideal temperature but then you've got to let the bees in as soon as you see female flowers. Great. Thank you, Mac. Like you said, we could talk about squash all day. <laughs> so let's talk about weeds with Jane. Um, they have plantain in their lawn. It's a Kentucky bluegrass lawn. It's not going away. They've tried 240 weed killer on the plant and it's not killed the weed. Is there another type of herbicide that is better for plantain? Um, yeah, there's a few different things you could use. Well, f well, first I would encourage the caller just to think about the timing of that application. It could have been that it was a little late. Uh, 2,4-D with a lot of species, if you don't get that on when the plant's relatively small, it might not be as effective. But I also think that like dicamba and I think triclopyr is uh, used on plantain as well in lawns and there, there are some products where that are triclopyr uh, labeled for lawn use. And then the other thing I would just encourage the caller to, to, or viewer to think about is keeping that lawn healthy, you know, watering it at the right time, fertilizing it at the right time. A healthy lawn does a lot to keep the weeds out. Mm -hmm. And I think too, you can, uh, you can um, I think plantain has a tap root. So if you don't have a lot of plants, you could just probably pop them out of the ground mm -hmm. when the ground is nice and soft. And that brings me to dandelions. Now that we've had a frost and it's cooling off, is it too late to treat dandelions in the yard right now? You know, I think if we get a little more, some warm weather again, uh, it might be a good time because we've had a little bit of moisture come through this weekend, which mm -hmm. sometimes prompts the, the dandelions to grow. Um, but I would say if, if it's not getting, if we don't get back into the 60s for a couple hours each afternoon, it's mm -hmm. probably getting a little late and probably better to wait till spring. Good, because I had a few that I was kind of looking at wondering. You can just forget about <laughs> just them Just forget spring. about them until next year. <laughs> that's right. Okay, that sounds great. Um, for uh, Leah, um, we have a call from Bozeman, um, and Brent can chime in on this too. Um, has anything been done at the federal level to ensure that unrestricted lamb or trade in lamb from the UK does not further jeopardize Montana's lamb industry? Well, I know that it has been a concern and it's definitely been brought up. I don't know specifically, Brent maybe has more info, information on that. Yeah, I know our congressional delegation has has been way aware of that. Um, it, it did show up in a <clears throat> in a news report that that Australia was basically, I think, going to try and help the UK send some lamb into the US. So what what the situation basically is is that um, the UK obviously hopefully everybody's aware of the Brexit deal where the UK is has basically voted to pull out of the EU that has a lot of extremely severe ramifications for their reciprocal trade agreements and they have not been able to renegotiate those in a timely manner so most people also don't realize that the UK currently has more lambs than New Zealand most people think of New Zealand as having more sheep than anybody in the world just because of their good ad campaign. New Zealand currently has about 24, 25 million head of sheep. The UK currently has about 35 million head of sheep. And they export up to a third of those lambs into the European Union. And so the the talk that was coming in through the news wires uh, several months ago was, well, we're not too worried about if we don't get a trade deal on the lamb side with the EU, because we'll just basically take it to the US because they have a free and open market. And so that obviously uh, raised some alarm bells here in the United States with our industry leaders and they passed those concerns up to our congressional staffers who've all been very, uh, very good about uh, keeping an eye on the situation, so. Okay. And just kind of a follow-up question to that, 
um, like with both New Zealand and the UK and other sources. Um, for meat especially, how do you ensure that you're actually gonna get Montana or US lamb um, rather than from New Zealand or the UK? Can be a little harder to find, but your best bets are specialty grocery stores and any farmers markets or farm to table type um, co-ops. And then we are putting together, Wool Growers is putting together um, lists of where you can buy lamb in Montana. So you can buy from, maybe you have a neighbor that you didn't know raises out some lambs and you can get one directly from them or something like that. So that will help people to find local lamb too. Yeah. And just a, Another aside um, on that, uh, this year we actually had the, or last year we had the opportunity to buy lamb from just a local producer that produces some for the regular market, but also for 4-H lambs. And this year, the 4-H lamb market was really down because even though they had um, a lot of the, uh, the um, animal production um, projects with 4-H, um, the numbers were definitely down, so a lot of the animals um, were going to that purpose. So um, this year, we were definitely insured of being able to get a lamb, and um, like I said, last year was the first time that we did, and it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. So we, we've enjoyed it a lot. Good, yes, the 4-H lambs are a great place to buy from any of your local county fairs, and the flip side to that is lambs don't really like to be alone. So usually if a 4-H member is raising a lamb, they usually have one or more at home as companion lambs or little company buddies. Um, and so they're usually looking to find a freezer for that one too. Great, okay, thank you, Leah. Um, for Mac, you know, we talked earlier about how we could talk about squash all day. Uh, there's a question from Bozeman. What is the best way to store squash in your home if you can't use it right away? Uh, depending on your objective, um, in a bin on the floor in the kitchen is just fine. It, it will keep for a, a couple months. If you want to have it keep longer, a cooler uh, environment, then room temperature would be better. So maybe in your basement. At my house, I have a insulated but unheated garage that shares a wall with my home. And so it, it, it rarely freezes in there, but it, it's definitely much cooler than it is anywhere in the house. And they'll take a little bit of, of uh, exposure to freezing temperatures, but really not much and not much below freezing. So I'd say the ideal storage temperatures would, would be in the 40 to 50 degree range for longer term storage, but they will endure being at room temperature for weeks, if not a couple months. And mm -hmm. that's uh, how they will turn to, to good tasting. And I'm gonna show you one more while we're here. <laughs> Impressive. And I, I often say, you know, people ask me something about, about something and I say, well, you can tell a lot from a name and this is a big exception to that. This is a North Georgia candy roaster oh my squash God. and this is one of the big ones. And I haven't eaten one yet, but it, it looks pretty good to me. It looks pretty right, but I'm going to let, let it store up and we've got some, some big, big lunkers there. So that's the, that's a, a cucurbita a maxima, I believe as well. And uh, that, that name doesn't tell you anything about it at all, I'm sure. And, could you say the name again? I didn't get it. You broke up a tiny bit. North Georgia Candy Roaster. North Georgia Candy Roaster. I'll have to look for, well, look for that one. Far North oh. Georgia, it did okay. So. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds great. We're gonna have to, have to get that on the list. So um, for Jane, um, they have barnyard grass in their horse pens. Uh, most of the seeds have fallen off the plants. Is there anything they can do now? And there is, a, is there a herbicide that can be used to control the seed bank? Mm. Yeah, so barnyard grass is, I'm pretty sure it's a summer annual, so it, it matures later in the summer, as opposed to like cheatgrass, which is a winter annual, it, it matures earlier in the summer. But it, yeah, if the seeds have already fallen off, I mean, if there's any way that you could do some raking and piling and probably burning, just try to kill those seeds. Um, but really, yeah, your best oppor you, the best opportunity to control it was missed probably, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. a month, couple months ago. Um, as far as a, like a pre-emergent herbicide for controlling the seeds in the seed bank, there is a new product um, on the market. It was just came out with a range and pasture label last summer. It's called Rejuvra, and it is a pre-emergent herbicide that can be used in places where grazing occurs. And it's, we've, been, we've done a little bit of work with it uh, here at MSU, 
and it, it looks very promising for like cheatgrass and bentonata control. Um, I'm not sure what it would do with barnyard grass, but it'd be worth looking at the label and seeing if it, if it was a species that's been tested with rejuvra. Okay, great, thank you. Um, for Leah, um, this is a question that came in from Lewistown. Uh, how has the sheep industry changed in the last 100 years? Oh gosh, it's changed a lot. I was just reading um, to Brent from this Montana Wool Grower magazine which was printed in 1888. And it was talking about um, how many sheep numbers they had lost in the late 1800s. But they were, you know, we had over 50 million sheep in the US at that time, and now we have about five. So number wise is probably one of the biggest thing that, biggest things that's happened to the sheep industry is we just have a lot fewer sheep overall. And um, you could take this a lot of different ways, I guess. Um, we've got a lot of, different breeds kind of re-emerging in kind of the hobby flock sector or um, those that have smaller flocks. And so we're seeing lots of different breeds across our state and across the US and more specialty marketing, I guess, as far as different wool type and quality and um, as the, in same with the meat breeds too. Um, for example, there are certain breeds that will just be raised for like a really long fleece and they can also be eaten of course too, but those long fleeces with certain types of hand spinners, they're really desirable. So some of that specialty wool has really come to light. Um, overall industry-wide, Brent probably has some great comments on this too, because he has gotten to see more of it change over time. So, so is that kind of a, I, I've been in the industry longer. Is that what you're saying, Leah? <laughs> yes, but I was saying it nicely. <laughs> Not that you're older. Uh, yeah. just a lot. Uh, no, it, the, the industry has changed substantially. Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting going back to the late 1800s that Leah was talking about. Uh, everybody knows about the big cow drives that, that came up uh, from Texas into eastern Montana, and there's still a lot of families out <clears throat> in eastern Montana that can trace their their ancestors back to Texas because of those cow drives. Um, we used to have large sheep drive actually that, that started in Northern California, Oregon, Washington. They used to come across Northern Nevada, come up over Monida Pass. Uh, they would winter in one of two spots. They would either, either winter in the Prickly Pear Valley or they would winter in Lake Basin. Most people don't know those places anymore, but the Prickly Pear Valley now is the Helena Valley and uh, Lake Basin is now Rapid J Molt. Uh, country and so that was where they were all wintered. They overwintered here in Montana. They were shorn in the spring and trailed east and they met the railroad uh, that was coming west through the Dakotas. And there was thousands of sheep, mostly weathers that that made those uh, changes. And so a lot of the chain had to do with with how we harvested lamb. In those days, that lamb basically had to be walked to market because we had no refrigeration. And it wasn't until we ended up with uh, refrigerated rail cars, uh, and I don't remember the exact year that they started, um, that we were able to, to move a lot of the processing facilities west. They always used to be on the east side of the US where the population was, where lamb was consumed. So a lot of those processing facilities move west now. Uh, and so now we, we truck everything, just like the beef industry, we're doing a lot of box lamb product. Uh, where we used to sell a lot of uh, a lot of lamb carcasses, the COVID uh, restrictions because of the ship. We used to sell a lot of lamb carcasses even two years ago into the restaurant trade, and they would break those lamb carcasses up and then have a special every night of what lamb cut that they were serving. With the COVID lockdown that we've gone through and, and the loss of the, the capacity in restaurants now, we're seeing a lot of Local people, <clears throat> like Leah was talking about, so we have a lot of local neighbors now that are selling their lamb directly to other neighbors or to local um, to local uh, grocery chains. But also the the major players, uh, you know, like Superior Lamb is probably one of the biggest one in the U.S. They have really put their emphasis back on producing uh, kind of a retail level, a single cut package or, or two or three kind of family pack cut package. Uh, to compete more uh, with the other protein sources that are out there on a retail level. Thank you. 
So, Mac, we have a question that came in from Helena. Is it still um, early, or is it, can we still seed a new lawn this year? Is it too late, or should we wait till next year, or could you sow a, a lawn this year? Uh, it kind of depends on the weather to come, but I think ideally you would have uh, sown uh, lawn grass to establish a new lawn uh, three, four weeks ago. Would have been better. But you never know when we're going to have that that year. If the weather stays like this uh, for another month, it could it could survive and, and be okay. Ideally, a little little bit ago though. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of like winter wheat, where you know October first is kind of the magic um, date in terms of ensuring that you're going to get the best possible outcome. And I think a yard would be a similar um, situation where you would want to have it get established and um, get some good energy down to the roots before it freezes. So it's a little more sensitive than winter wheat, actually. Even yeah. <laughs> the same idea, but, a but the more same sensitive. idea. Yeah. So so Jane. Um, here's a question that came in from Hot Springs. Um, they have Ventanata on a large ranch in, in northwestern Montana, and they'd like to use the new herbicide Rejuvra, but they're wondering, is there any benefit of tank mixing it with Plateau, which they've used in the lot, a lot in the past, to cold, control those weeds? Yeah, so I, I think the last question, I talked about Rejuvra a little bit. It's a pre-emergent herbicide, so it works best when you when you apply it before the seeds of ventanata or cheatgrass or another annual, if you, you have it in the soil before the plant germinates. Um, if you miss that opportunity and the, the ventanata or the cheatgrass has emerged, then there would be some benefit of adding plateau mm -hmm. because that's a, it works on the foliage, it's post-emergent. What's kind of interesting about this fall is that it's been extremely dry and I have not seen uh, like ventanata or cheatgrass emerging much in this part of the state. I have talked to a few people in other parts of the state and they just haven't seen the emergence of these winter annual grasses that we typically see by this time in the fall because it's been so dry. So I would encourage the person to, if, if they aren't seeing any ventanata emerged yet, then I would just, I would not do the tank mix. If they're seeing some emergence, then there would be some benefit of doing that. Now, it would increase the price, and Rejuvra is pretty pricey the way it is, so it also kind of depends on what the person's, uh, you know, uh, economically, how much they want to do, make that investment. If they do just use the Rejuvra, they, they may see a little less control next summer, but that herbicide stays in the soil for a good time and, and they'll still see good control the second and third year. So if I recall, it's just two or three years ago that you brought the first plants of Ventanata into the studio to show people what it looked like and to educate people what this new weed was. So since that time, how much has that weed sp spread and is it becoming more of a problem? Yeah, it has spread a lot. Um, it was actually added, I first saw Ventanata in about 2014 or 15, and it was scattered in infestations. Mm -hmm. It has increased a lot. It was added to the noxious weed list in 2019. So it's, it's increased enough to that a lot of people noticed it. It, it got petitioned and, and listed. Um, but I would say it's still in the stage where we can really do something about it. And it is increasing across the state. I think, you know, a few years back there were nine or ten counties that had documented it. Now it's, you know, 20 plus counties. Mm -hmm. But even in those counties, it's only occurring in small patches. So, you know, we, if, we, if we get on it, especially with these herbicides that have the soil residual and can control the seed bank, I think we have a chance against mm -hmm. it. Okay, well, there's always job security with weeds. I'm afraid there is, yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. So we have a question that came in from Dylan on potatoes. So this grower is growing purple potatoes, and they want to know the best way to store them to avoid past problems with sprouting. So the two main varieties are purple skin potatoes that are grown um, by Montana gardeners are Purple Viking and Huckleberry Gold, um, which are both fairly short season varieties, and which means that they just mature earlier in the summer. 
and because of that they're ready to grow earlier next year so in general their storage isn't quite as long as some of the other varieties especially some of the russets like a standard russet Burbank um, the best thing that you can do is keep them as cool as possible um, if you think, if you have the opportunity to keep them at 45 to 50 degrees um, that's really optimal for storing potatoes if you put them into the refrigerator it actually it, it harms the quality if you're going to fry them because um, if potatoes are stored under cold conditions, they will um, produce sugars and the, the starch will convert um, to sugar. And then when you fry them, they'll get to be dark brown. Some people actually like that and prefer that. I actually kind of like a brown French fry, <laughs> but, uh, but some people um, definitely don't like that. And they also will have just a little bit sweeter flavor. So um, in general, it's not recommended to store them in the refrigerator, but if you don't mind that extra little bit of browning, that will help keep them from sprouting. But, but um, aside from that, as cool as possible. So, okay, um, moving back to sheep. Um, so in Australia, and either Leah or Brent can answer this, um, they market a type of meat called hogget, which is older than lamb, but younger than mutton. Is this something that is a product in the U.S.? Does, do either of you know anything about that? No, it's, it's not a, a the, the USDA basically sets the standards for what they call lamb. And so basically anything, technically anything over, in the meat processing industry, we have what we call a break joint in the knee. It's a very technical way of determining if something is lamb or mutton. Um, most people generally, uh, you can, you can use teeth too, uh, and look and see when permanent teeth come in. Realistically, once something gets past and it changes with breed and, and how the animals are managed, but anywhere from about 12 months up to, you could probably go up to about 16 months in the U S, um, somewhere in there, you're going to have that break between what's considered a lamb product and what's considered a mutton product. Australia, they have another definition called a hogget. Hogget is a technical term. Most people in the livestock industry would know it as a yearling. And so basically they say anything that uh, from birth to one year of age is a lamb. And then from one year of age to two years of age is a hogget. And then anything from two years uh, and older would be considered mutton. And the mutton trade actually is quite interesting. They, the mutton trade in Australia has, they have been sending a lot of mutton to, uh, to China because uh, if you know anything about the COVID-19 is not the only viral pandemic going through the world affecting agriculture. We also have, have African swine fever, which is making its rounds, has really decimated the pork population in China. Uh, and they are heavily dependent on that pork supply domestically in China. And with that reduction in pork available domestically, they have been sourcing a lot of their protein, both out of Australia and New Zealand, and they've been buying a lot of mutton uh, out of Australia and New Zealand, mostly out of Australia. Okay, thank you, Brent. Um, yep. Leah, um, how and when are sheep sheared? And is the shearing process, is that something that hurts them? I'll speak briefly on this and then Brent can talk about it too, since he is indeed a shearer himself. But um, sheep are shorn different times of the year, depending on what we're getting ready for. So this time of year, um, they might be getting what we call either tagging or tag an eye, and they will be basically getting trimmed around their face and then around their hind end. And it's preparing them for breeding season. And it also helps to keep their face open so that they can see predators more readily and they don't get wool growing too close to their eyes. So that's what will be happening this time of year when people are preparing to breed because sheep are bred typically from about, well, it's usually in the fall. It depends on when you want a lamb, it's about a five month gestation. So then again, the sheep will be shorn in the spring when their full body will be shorn. And that typically happens before lambing. And that prepares the ewe to have her lambs. Um, she takes up less space inside the barn. So if you need to get the sheep inside out of the weather, that's a good reason to shear. Um, it also gets that heavy fleece off of them before they lamb. It keeps them a lot cleaner so they don't get birthing fluids and all of that on their fleece when they have their lambs. And it also helps the lambs to be able to find their udder to nurse. 
So typically most shearing occurs in the spring from February to May, depending on when you lamb. And as far as shearing itself, um, as I mean, if it is done correctly, no, it should not hurt the sheep. And that's why it's so important for shearers to have good training. And um, shearers are very, very technically skilled. And pr the practice, I mean, Brent, I don't know how many sheep Brent has shorn in his life, but good shearers are so fun to watch because they get that fleece off. The sheep feels better having that weight taken off of them. And then they get started on growing their fleece for the next year. So it's just a cycle. And Brent can speak more to this too. Yeah, the industry is has, uh, we've kind of gone through a revolution. So, I mean, with a lot of it, you probably get tired of listening to me talk about what's going on in Australia, but but they've got all the sheep over there. I mean, when you've got a shear uh, in the year 2000, they had uh, over 100 million head of sheep. They're down to about 65 million head now. That's a lot of sheep to shear and a lot of, of uh, shears to train and they have very dedicated national programs that are funded by the wool growers uh, to do training. So we've copied some of that over here. We uh, pre COVID uh, the last couple of years, we've brought one of their trained instructors over. There are um, several main shearing uh, contractors in Montana that help us along with Montana wool growers, bring these individuals over this spring or this, uh, this fall and, and into winter, Montana wool growers and some of the ranchers here in Montana are sponsoring three different uh, shearing schools. Uh, we have a beginner's school in December. There's still a few spots left in that. So uh, Leah will be attending that school. So you can ask her in January about, about shearing. But it is a very, it looks very easy on YouTube. There's a lot of bad publicity out there. Most of the bad PR, uh, the bad videos that you see are by very poorly trained uh, individuals that are in the shearing business. And so we tried to take a very proactive approach to this, not only the American sheep industry, but the uh, Montana wool growers and a lot of the other state associations and have stepped up their funding and have really worked with the universities to try and provide that technical high level of expertise that it takes to get somebody from a beginning shearer up to a professional shearer. Like Leah said, done correctly, uh, a good shearer will, will, we call it harvesting wool. Uh, we tell all of our beginning shearers that technically you are harvesting wool. Um, and in 2018, I like to point out to everybody that when you when you take an ag commodity, we sell a lot of our ag commodities by the ton. So good quality hay or good quality cow hay runs $125, $130 a ton. Uh, you know, we sell a lot of those commodities that way. Our highest uh, valued wool, when it was harvested correctly, put up correctly and marketed correctly in 2018 and early 2019 was selling for $10,000 a ton. So I can tell you that the growers that are producing that kind of wool, they are very interested in having highly skilled people harvesting that, that wool for them. Great, thank you, Brent. Um, for Mac, a caller from Whitefish, and I think they actually do need some, some very good advice. Um, they need tips for planting and growing watermelon next year. Um, this year's cold spring and early summer absolutely killed the crop. Watermelon, did you say in Dillon? Whitefish. Oh, whitefish. Uh, okay, uh, everything we said about winter squash, except it's all twice as important to, to be on top of. So if I was gonna try to grow watermelon in Montana, <clears throat> I would start with uh, black plastic mulch to warm the soil, put it on drip. I would put transplants out as early as I thought I could get away with and be prepared to protect them from frost. I would put row cover on until flowers. I would pick the earliest variety you possibly can. You're just not going to grow a large watermelon here, uh, but some of the smaller uh, personal size lunchbox watermelons uh, can be made to ripen. Uh, I would pull out all the stops on retaining heat that you possibly can. And then <clears throat> as they start to ripen, you do need to, to, to lay off the water a little bit. Um, a good quality melon uh, does require uh, a little bit of a transition into drier soil conditions as they ripen, otherwise they can burst. So it's possible. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't plan to go to the bank on it or, or start a business yeah. around it. 
It's more of a novelty than anything else, I think. Yeah, so my husband and I used to grow water or watermelon and cantaloupe commercially in Billings, and it's very possible to do it there. You know, the Dixon area, we get melons that come in from there. Um, those areas are definitely suitable. Every few <coughs> years, I try to grow melons, both watermelon and cantaloupe in Bozeman. And I'm trying to persuade my husband to build me even a better structure so that I can grow them. And he's like, you can buy perfectly good ones and, you know, from Dixon. We have, you know, family that lives in Billings. We can still get good melons. So, um, but, you know, it's fun. And it's like, if you enjoy doing it and really going for it, um, yeah, pull out all the, all the stops, just like Max said. So, <laughs> so to Jane. Um, I, think, I think cantaloupes and muskmelons are a little easier than watermelons. At least with those, you know when they're ripe because they slip off the vine. Right. Usually you can do it with the watermelons. The ripeness is such an ambiguous thing, and and it's always the night before the frost when you're wondering if they're ripe or not, and then they're only you know, two-thirds. So they're almost ripe. They're edible, but not great. Yeah, you know, they're always a little disappointing. So, <laughs> so um, Jane, um, a great question came in from Big Timber. Um, and this is very timely with our subject today. Um, what noxious weed species can be controlled using sheep? And is there a good way to combine sheep grazing and herbicide for control of weeds? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, yeah, uh, Brent and Leah chime in too. Uh, there's, there's several species that you can use sheep or goats for uh, managing probably two that would be the most relevant for Montana because we have large acreages mm -hmm. you know it would be spotted knapweed and leafy spurge and there's also been a lot of research done on um, the best timing and the best way to do this so that the the plant the weed is controlled but also you know the health of the the livestock is recognized there's also a publication that University of Idaho put out quite a few years ago now that talks about targeted grazing and it has prescriptions for target grazing several different noxious weeds. In terms of uh, combining like targeted grazing and herbicides, I know like with leafy spurge one of the things you can do is you can use the sheep to graze that throughout the summer, um, pull them off in late summer, you know, August or so, let the spurge regrow three or four inches and then do a fall herbicide application. So there's different, you could, you could use sheep to graze the bulk of an infestation, but perhaps maybe spray around the edge to keep it from spreading. Um, but yeah, there are ways to do that. And it's, a, it's a great strategy when you're dealing with some of these noxious weeds that are spread across large landscapes. Thank you, Jane. Um, we have another question that came in for Leah, and I'm surprised this question actually hasn't come in yet. Um, what are the biggest predator issues that sheep producers face in Montana? Well, overall, I would say it's the coyote. Um, we have a lot of coyotes across the state, and um, many of the regions where sheep are produced, there's pretty good coyote populations. And lambs are especially vulnerable to coyotes just because they are born so small. So that is definitely something that sheep producers put a lot of time and effort into um, trying to keep those lambs safe all through the summer and even into the fall. I've lost 100 pound lambs to coyotes before. They're, you know, if they're hungry enough, they they get pretty aggressive. So, um, and then additionally, you know, depending on where you live in the state, Southwest Montana and the Rocky Mountain Front, of course, they've got grizzly bear issues. And then, you know, mountain lions, uh, Sheep are, especially when they're young, um, are fairly vulnerable even to uh, big predator birds. So, Brent, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, coyotes are still, like Leah said, she was reading uh, the that Wolverine magazine from the late 1800s, and you can go back and read all of those old ag publications. And the one thing that's never changed in the sheep industry in, in America is, is they, they, they complain about coyote predation and imports of lamb and wool just something that's been in our industry for a long time. Um, it's something we're struggling with anymore because as sheep numbers decrease, as the number of operations that have sheep decrease, we're, we're starting to see kind of islands of sheep left in the state. So areas 
uh, you know, in the Dillon country and out like in the flowing wells on the Little Dry and, and in the Judith Gap country where they do say in that Garneal country where they have a lot of spurge where they need sheep to control the spurge so they can run cows. Um, you're starting to see islands kind of like that. And so those, those producers try to work together. Um, there's been a lot of shifts in how we try to manage predators. I think the emphasis moving forward, a lot of it has gone to non-lethal mitigation of predators. So we're starting to see a lot more guard dogs out there, which creates a lot of issues. Uh, you know, those dogs, they, they tend to be a little territorial. We're starting to learn how to keep those dogs closer in with the sheep. Uh, it, it gets to be an issue on days, uh, weekends like this weekend when it was opening weekend of pheasant season. So now we're introducing a, a lot of new dogs out onto uh, places where they haven't been uh, and have never been around livestock. And so what I would tell people since it is pheasant season and we're going to have a lot of hunters out there, if you uh, come across one of these guard dogs, a lot of people are really, they're very intimidated by them. Most of these dogs are, uh, they put up, put on a good show for humans. So they'll maybe uh, come at you, maybe in a, in a little bit of an aggressive manner. They're there to protect their thank sheep. Thank you, Brent. They, We're just about done here. Okay. So okay. thank I'll you. I'll wrap it up. But, but the one thing you need to remember is don't run from them. They, they, when you stand your ground, they will get about five feet from you and they'll stop and wag their tail and they're happy to see you. So. Okay, tune in next week for a show on canola production. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee,